Assalamu alaikum. So I'm going to start with a story. Uh, I'm sure you guys are, uh, remember the story of uh, Bilal ibn Rabah when, Allah, when the Prophet Muhammad opened Mecca, when they came back and the opening of Mecca. And he went up to the Kaaba, on top of the Kaaba, and he made adhan as a, as a symbol of uh, now Islam is starting back in Mecca, and he made the adhan. So the Prophet ﷺ, while Bilal was making, uh, عنه, when he was uh, making the, the adhan on top of the Kaaba, there were a group of, of, uh, of boys talking, and one of these boys was making fun of Bilal while he was making the adhan, and, and his name was Abu Mahdura. So he was, oh, you know, like, you know how you see with you sometimes, like, oh, you know, even with girls, like, oh, look at how she's walking, or look at how she's dressed, or I can't believe he thinks he's so cool, or, you know, th that kind of conversation they were having with each other. So uh, this young man was kind of making fun of Bilal's adhan and his voice. So the Prophet ﷺ overheard this conversation, and he had learned from those around him and the companions that were around him that this individual, this young man that was making fun of Bilal, actually had a very beautiful voice himself. Um, and he almost felt slighted because nobody really gave him a chance to, to give the adhan. So the Prophet ﷺ called him up and he said, uh, he told the people around him, he said, go call this young man. And so they said, oh, the Prophet wants to talk to you, wants, wants to talk to you. And he was shaken, he was afraid, like, oh, you know, he knew what I said or what did I do? And so he goes to the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet said to him, he didn't mention anything about what he said to the, to the youth. He said, I heard you have a beautiful voice. And, and the, the young man said, yes, I, I do, you know, like he's, he's, he's worried. So the Prophet said, I want you to start making adhan in Mecca. And when you look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu that this young man, he really did have a beautiful voice and he did continue to make the adhan. And, and, and the, but he was so, uh, he was given the opportunity for, for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to use his talents and his interests to do something that he wanted. But if we had looked at this young man, oh, what kind of person are you making fun of Bilal, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Why are you saying those type of things? If we, if that was our reaction and how we interacted with this young man, he would have never been given that opportunity. And so to build on what uh, Dr. Samira was talking about in terms of mental health stigma, I think we also need to look at the lens of mental health and wellness. How do we offer our youth, how do we offer our families opportunities to grow psychologically and mentally and socially in all aspects? We care so much as parents and as individuals that we give our kids the best academic experience, right? You know, we want, to, we want them in the best schools. And we, we care so much about them, uh, you know, having... Uh, their medical uh, uh, records are up to date. You know, do they ha they go to the right doctor? You know, and we we care so much about so many things, but we forget about mental health. And that's not, and mental health is a very important aspect of our Islamic tradition. I'm not pulling it out of a hat and now because I'm a therapist, you know, that I'm saying this. But this is how the Prophet Sallallahu teaches us and how he dealt with those that, those that are around him. That he focused on mental health. He didn't wait. A lot of times when people come into my office, it's like they wait so long when an issue is so bad. They wait so long, whether it's, you know, issues with their children or, you know, marital issues or they wait until it's so horrible and it's like right on the cusp of just destruction, right? And they're like, please help me. And so it, it's like the mental health um, uh, professional is there as a last resort, as someone, oh, if it's so bad, I'm just going to go and figure out mental health. And they don't think of it as something that's preventative, that what can I do as a parent or as an educator or someone who is around youth or is around other people in general, what can I do to really uh, bring that type of awareness to my community, to really bring that awareness that it's important to have that mental health. Um, so I, I, um, um, I want to be able to focus on eight eight different aspects that I think is important to mental health that you can find in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu but in the interest of time, I don't know if I'm going to get into everything, but I'm going to try my best, inshallah. So for, for any individual, 
Every individual needs to feel like they have meaning and purpose. When they live on this uh, uh, um, earth, they need to feel that there's a reason why they're here. And we have that in the Qur'an. Many verses in the Qur'an tells us, tells us that we are trustees on this earth. We have to take care of the earth. It, uh, we're here so that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't just say that, but it gives us some meaning and a purpose. But to be able to give a flavor and a tint based on the personality of of, your, uh, of the individual is very important. So that's number one, meaning and purpose. Number two, spirituality. A sense or a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important. And it's very important in the mental health realm. Whether you're Muslim or not, uh, you, when, you, when you go into the counseling realm and you talk to therapists, the idea of, we call it existential theory. What, what is the feeling that there's a higher power, that there's something bigger than me, that there's something that I have to answer to. This is a very important uh, uh, aspect of mental health, and this is the core of our, our Islamic tradition. Uh, creativity, to be able, that's number three, creativity, to be able to give people or individuals the opportunity to see creativity in their lives. So man-made things, like some people, they're, they think the invention of the iPhone is amazing or architecture, or art, or literature. So based on your personality, again, what do you, to be able to see creativity in others and creativity in yourselves is a very important part of mental health. Um, Nature, to have that connection with nature. We have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that tells us that a day of contemplation can be better than a year of ritual worship, right? And in so many verses of the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ how, do we contemplate? Are we people who contemplate? Sometimes we go through and we say, well, what does that have anything to do with mental health? Sometimes we, we go through the motions of every day, you know, wake up in the morning, eat, sleep, go to work, go to school, go to sleep. And we don't have the, the, this connection to the outside world. We're like in four walls, right? We're with our electronics and we forget to have that connection with nature and that's what connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is connected to the spirituality aspect that I had talked about earlier. But to be able to go outside, take a hike, go walk in, on grass barefoot, to feel the rain on your skin. And I, um, I do this activity with, with some of my clients, we call it the core value bank. And uh, the person who invented it or who came up with it is Steven Stasny. You can look him up. Um, and basically what I, what I have some youth do when they come into my office is I say, okay. And, and it's not that they have to have a, an issue, but this is preventative mental health. So what, do you, what inspires you in nature? Do you like the sound of rain? Do you like the smell of rain? Do you like to walk on grass barefoot? Every person is different, but to be able to identify in your core value or your core value bank, what is important to you? What is important to you spiritually? What is important to you uh, in nature? What's important to you man-made creati creatively? So let's see, how many did I cover? One, two, three, four, okay. Compassion, to be able to identify that you are in a, a compassionate individual. What are some things that you do as an individual out of compassion? Can that person, can you identify at least three things in the past week that you did out of compassion without any, any, uh, anything in return? And this is what Islam teaches us, that when, when, when uh, two people love each other for the sake of Allah, they are included in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yawm al-qiyamah. They don't want anything in return. They're not looking for anything in return. That's what compassion is. And it's a very important part of mental health and mental wellness. Um, we also have uh, love. Who are the people that you identify that, you, that love you and that you love them? Tomorrow, uh, we're doing a love language uh, workshop. So I'd love for you to join us at the Family Youth Institute track, um, inshallah. How do you identify what your love language is? What do you... What, how do you speak love to others? And it's important that we establish that trust and that love with others. The Prophet ﷺ in everything that he did, he, he exemplified love. I'll give you an example from the seat of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, there was a young woman, I don't remember her name, but I'll tell you tomorrow, um, uh, that she was young, she was orphaned. The Prophet ﷺ took her to the market and when he was with her in the market, he bought her a necklace. And he put the necklace on her and then when he put the, after he put the necklace on her, she said, the people when they buried her, she told them, 
do not take the necklace off. It was so special to her that she kept the necklace on for her entire life and she went to her grave with the necklace on. And that shows you how much the Prophet Sallallahu connected with this, with this young woman. Um, so a part of mental health is being able to feel that you are loved and that you are loving others. Community, that you feel like you're a part of community. That's another one. Community, that you feel like you're a part of something. It doesn't have to be an Islamic community. That can be one of your communities. You're part of your masjid group or your youth group. But any other community, are you a part of an educator's community or a, a, a drama community or a, a, a book club community or your neighborhood? It doesn't matter, but you feel like you're a part of a group. Um, and then last, I think that's, that's last, yes. Last is humanity. That you feel like you could help any stranger in any situation if you were, uh, if they are in danger. And you don't have to know that person. That you have a level of humanity with them. So, uh, sometimes I help people visualize what that means. If you're driving a car, if you're driving a car, and there's a car in front of you that's driving, and it's a slippery road, it's snowy, it's slippery, and that car gets into an accident and hits a pole. What's the first inclination? What are you going to do? You're following that car. What are you going to do? Okay, you're going to call 911. Then what? Okay, the police are coming or the ambulance is coming. Then what? What are you going to do? You're just going to leave those people in the car? So your first inclination is, I'm going to go and help those people, right? So you get out of your car. You go to that car. You see if they're okay. But I'm going to give you another twist to the story. So you go to this car and then you notice that the mom who's driving the car is unconscious, or the parent that's driving the car is unconscious. And there's like a four-year-old child that's stuck in the back seat and crying. Mom's unconscious. What are you going to do? Right, so you pull the kid out, right? You're going to try to save this. So you the, mom's, the mom's unconscious. She's alive, but she's unconscious. But she can't get out. She's stuck. Then you pull the kid out. You take the kid out. What do you do with the kid? Comfort them, right? That's your first inclination. You're going to comfort that kid. You're going to hold them. You're going to say, are you okay? Everything's going to be fine. Your mom's going to be okay. And then when you do that, you notice what happens to this child. The child relaxes. They melt. They, they calm down. Do you know this child? No. Does the child know you? No. It's a part of the human psyche. It's just a part of who we are. That we like to help people we we like to we feel for people we we worry about their feelings and we have empathy for that people when we lose that part of ourselves that's where we run into mental mental health issues when we lose when we lose any one of those aspects that i just mentioned in terms of mental health that's where it starts going into mental illness but it's unfortunate that in a lot of our you know in, in our islamic or in our muslim community we wait we wait until it's so bad and then we're like, oh, you know, I have a mental health issue and I, I need help from a therapist or I need help. Instead of saying, okay, what about my wellness? Um, do I have all of these aspects that I just mentioned? Do I have love? Do I have compassion? Do I have creativity? Do I have... And as a parent, do I try to instill these things in my own children? Do I allow my children to see, to experience nature, to, ex to see the creativity in themselves, to show compassion, to feel that humanity? It's not enough for us to watch these videos on YouTube or whatever and say, oh, I feel humanity with, with different countries around the world or people who are dying around the world and off, turn off the TV, it's over. No, to experience every one of those things, that's what brings mental health and that's what a very big part of erasing that stigma that Dr. Samira was talking about earlier. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, so I'm going to read um, three uh, questions that... Um, uh, sister Dua chose. So the first one is, what should one do when they sink so far into their mental illness that they are struggling to pray and haven't performed prayer in several years? Are they no longer con considered Muslim? What should they do to get back? And we decided that this question goes uh, together with uh, the second question, do you believe that God would grant mercy to mentally ill through suicide? Okay, I, I'm not an Islamic scholar, so I can't tell you like the fatwa behind it or anything like that. But what I do know is that we cannot judge people what's in, we don't, we can't judge how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will treat people in the akhirah. 
what's between what's in their hearts is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when someone reaches a point like suicide or a point where they feel so hopeless or helpless for whatever reason because they haven't fulfilled those eight things that we talked about or they don't feel like they have someone who cares about them or love or their mental health issue has gone to a level that it's so difficult to deal with that they feel like not living on this earth is better than living on the earth then that's not something that I can judge that I can say that that's something that God will forgive or not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he he is merciful this is what how I think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he's merciful beyond beyond comprehension and if someone is going through an illness and something that they are having struggle with it really the 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 onus of that responsibility doesn't doesn't lie in that person individually it really a very big part of it is us as a community a lot of times people don't go to a mental health professional to get help or to seek help because of the stigma because of what people are going to say because of the fear that they have or the way that they were raised uh, uh this is something that it, it's it's a responsibility that we all carry not that just individual so i can't say that that person is going to be forgiven or not forgiven by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah has his mercy is beyond limits is beyond limits and and it's something some it's a, if it's a result of a mental health issue that's not something that i can judge um i i think this also relates to another question that someone here that said looking around the room the audience is predominantly female and uh you know how do we get males in this situation and and, and the reason why i think it's related is i think we don't give uh kids or youth or our children in our community enough opportunity to grow roots i mentioned this in the last session but particularly males particularly males we we're, we're always so rough on the males in our community we don't allow them to be in touch with their emotions and 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 sometimes that's what leads to this this problem of feeling like you're alone and you have nowhere to go and there's no point in living on this earth because nobody really cares about how i feel it's because the way that we have raised our children particularly males is that no you got to suck it up you got to be tough you can't feel those feelings those feelings are not right right so we have those we we don't build those roots to to have people grow the other question was about salah or was it yeah the salah yeah so um if you if you if you feel like you've fallen so deep and so what are you struggling to pray um again if this is a mental health issue i would seek professional help but again sometimes like i was talking about contemplation sometimes the stepping stone to doing that ritualistic prayer is to go out in nature. I really strongly believe in this. Is that one of the first stepping stones? Maybe that maybe you need to take that first step first before you can actually feel the flavor and the taste of salah. To be able to go outside, find what interests you. Do you like the beach? Do you like the mountains? What is it that you like? And connect with nature. Sometimes being in the in 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 his creation connects you with the creator in ways that are incomprehensible. Again, that's not a solution to your mental health issue. You probably need professional help if that's it's that's where you are. But that's a great stepping stone to get you to connect to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala on a more ritualistic uh, sense. The other thing to kind of add on what, what Dua was saying is you know, sometimes with salah it seems like it's such a big deal, like I can't get myself to it. <clears throat> Break it down to smaller steps. You know, maybe it's first have a conversation with Allah. You know, it, may, it doesn't even have to be in Salah. Just, you know, you know, when you do what I was saying, going out in nature, seeing his creation, just talk to him in your own language. Maybe then the next step would be to really contemplate and, you know, ha have, have a time period where you can... Um, you know, really talk and learn and connect with other people who are connected with him, right? How, that could be the next step. And then maybe it could just be in the masjid listening to Quran. You know, you work it up slowly but surely. But like Dua said, get, you know, you can't solve your mental health issue with Salah. Salah is augment, it augments the work. It helps you connect. It helps you find a purpose. But it's not going to solve it if you're depressed, and so iman is helpful in, a cope, as in terms of coping, but only if you're able to access it. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have a problem. 
And also realize with, uh, with depression, and anxiety, there's also a biological root to it. So for some people, it may be biologically based and you just need to take the medication. You know, some people it's environmentally based. You have to, f when you go to a therapist, they can help you, help you figure out what's going on. Is it, you know, 100% environmentally related? Or is it 100%, you know, biologically related? What's going on? And so that's another thing to do um, to help you with that. Um, two other questions that I had was, how do you handle those who associate mental health issues with jinn and evil eye? Um, so we know that jinns do exist and the evil, you know, within Islamic tradition, but we don't know ex the details of what exactly you know the manifestation of jinns are. So if you have somebody um, who who is attributing it to jinns, what I usually recommend people saying is, okay, you know. It may be the jinns, who knows? But, you know, the suffering that you're having, you know, let's also look into what else can we do to address the issue. Do, you know, do what you want, what you think is helpful for the jinns, but let's also take these other approaches to treatment. Wouldn't it be nice to be not have those issues, right? And you can say, you know, after you go through this process, you know, let's see what works. In the end, we want to get rid of the issues. So if you, that way works, great, but let's give this other one a, a, ch a chance. So that's another thing um, you could try. Another thing is how would you respond to those who demean label mental illness as absence of faith? The Prophet وسلم, talked about it. He gave us a dua for it. The very fact that he gave us a dua indicates it's the reality of life. And it's something he pointed out and said, seek Allah's protection from this. He's instructing us to do it. Then doesn't that indicate this is an issue that we as humans experience? So that's another thing. We don't know our faith. We don't understand how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to address these issues. And part of it is we have... We have um, lost our heritage in the mental health world. We, we're not aware of how much, like a lot of the psychotherapy techniques and history uh, is rooted within Islamic tradition. I mean, the first mental health hospital was in Cairo, right? The first therapeutic approaches were used in the Muslim world. We are the ones who started this field, even before Freud or anybody else. We're the ones who started it. And we're actually, one of the things that we're trying to do within the FYI is we have, we have research and we have education. So this is kind of an education aspect that we're doing. But one of our team members is really looking at the historical contributions of Muslim psychologists to the field of psychology. And he's tracing it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam time to the the downfall of our Islamic thought in mental health field and continuing in terms of what's going on in, in terms of right now, but really unpackaging what has been done by the scholars in terms of anxiety, depression, in terms of treatment, all of that. We have this heritage and yet very few of us know about it. And so inshallah, that's one of the things that we are trying to do to help destigmatize uh, mental health for the community inshallah.